Welcome to our second study on the Gospel of John. Uh, last week we looked at the very first chapter of John, John's prologue, and how we can know that there's a God by looking at nature and from our conscience. And when John begins his first chapter, he just says, in the beginning was the Word. And then we went back and looked at Genesis and how the very first words of the Bible say, in the beginning, God. There isn't some elaborate proof or argument for God. God just assumes that we will know that he exists because of the world around us and our conscience. And if you look at the review question there, it says we can know what God is like because he has revealed himself in the person of Jesus. So not only can we know that there's a God, but we can know what he's like because of Jesus and Jesus' word. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, John says. And John's name for the word is the Lugus in Greek. And in the English it just says the word. And we're told that the word was with God and brought everything into existence. It's through whom God brought the world into existence. Um, Lugus being that first thought, that abstract reason that gets expressed in a similar way. The Word, the Lugus, the second person of the Trinity, true God himself, is the expression of God. He shows us what God is like. Um, he is God in flesh. Tonight we're going to look at how Jesus, this word, this word of God, is the sinner's substitute. Uh, but before we begin, let's, let's say a little prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, you revealed yourself to us most clearly in your Son, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. He came into our world, he spoke your truth, he is the truth, and he himself is also our substitute the one who makes us right with you, who takes away our sins and brings us righteousness and the promise of eternal life. Help us to see him tonight in our study. Amen. So the opening question there, the intro question, says, what are some ways that you can tell that the world is not supposed to to be the way that it is, um, what are some ways that you can tell you are not the way you are supposed to be? So first of all, the world. What are some things that tell us the world is not the way that it's supposed to be? Because God created everything perfect. And what would be some examples of it not being perfect? <laughs> trees rot. Trees and, rot. Um, blight on produce and weeds. 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 Animals attack each other and humans. Yeah. Floods, fires destroying things. Pandemics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the reaction to pandemics. The ire and the division among humans. Um, What's that? Wars. Wars, rumors of wars. I mean, all kinds. We, and, and then, you know, we can even look at ourselves. There are ways that we know that we are not the way we are supposed to be. Uh, last time we talked about conscience and how our conscience tells us that. Um, you know, I was just listening to a podcast where a professional athlete, she was a professional cyclist, and she had to see a sports psychologist to separate her results from her work. You know, in, in bike racing, you rarely win because, you know, team sports, there are two teams and you often win. In bike racing, sometimes there's a hundred athletes, they're all professional level. So some, some pro cyclists only win a handful of times in their entire career. And going, you know, working her way up to that level, you're winning all the time as a junior and on the le lesser levels. And then you get to the professional ranks and you no longer win. And her value, her self-worth, was tied to her results. And I think 
people do that on many different levels, whether that's your job, uh, your vocation as a mother or a grandmother. Um, we tie our self-worth to something outward and external, but yet we're never able to completely reach up even to our own expectations. So we, and not only that, then we find this thing that we, we even sometimes do evil things. We sometimes sin, even if it's just in our thoughts or our words. And that really shows us we're not what we are supposed to be. Um, the interesting thing, and some have actually used this as an argument, is sometimes you'll even hear non-believers say something like, it just shouldn't be that way. Or so-and-so should not have been taken so early or so young. It's just not fair. But that argumentation in itself kind of presupposes that there's a way things should go. That there is a way that things should be. Um, and because if you think about it, really, if there were no God, no one in control of this whole thing, then why would you ever think there's a way that anything should go? Um, you know, especially if you believe in simple materialistic world, evolutionary forces, well, they would tell us that death and dying and dominance is part of the whole purpose. So when that happens, you think you just be like, well, that's how it's supposed to be. But nobody thinks that. Everybody, whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, you'd say that isn't how it's supposed to be. So the very fact that there's a way that we think things are supposed to be kind of speaks to a higher purpose or a higher power behind uh, our world and our lives. Um, simply stated, right, we know as Christians, what does the Bible tell us is the reason that things aren't the way they're supposed to be? Sin. Sin. That first rebellion against God that has continued since the beginning. You look at number one there, it says, last time we heard that John the Baptist was sent to be a witness to testify about Jesus. I don't know if you brought your Bibles this evening. If you didn't, I will have it up on the screen. But we're going to continue in chapter 1 as we're introduced to John the Baptist. And we have some verses here. Um, is everybody willing to read tonight? Or to... S no, rather not, Z? Okay. Um, Pat, would you read those first verses for us? So John the Baptist... Now I'm reading from the... Um, uh, English Standard Version. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, and we have it up here. We'll see there really aren't many differences. Okay. Yeah. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before, before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him. But for this purpose I came, baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. So remember last time, we were told that John is not the light. He just testifies concerning the light. And now, you know, John is somewhere around 30, maybe mid-30s. And he's on the shores of the Jordan. And he sees Jesus coming and he says, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Summarize John's testimony in your own words. And here's a picture from a movie of John the Baptist, a, a wild-haired, wild, wildly dressed guy who hung, on, hung out in the wilderness and ate uh, locusts and honey was his diet. Uh, people would go out to see him. He understood that his job was to get people ready for the Messiah. His whole job was to simply point people to the Messiah, to Jesus. And the words he uses here, look, the Lamb of God. Number two says, John the Baptist identifies Jesus as the Lamb of God. Now, this it requires a little bit of background knowledge to know what he's referring to when he calls Jesus the Lamb of God. And even Bible scholars have kind of debated about 
exactly what John is referring to here. The most obvious and probably the most highly held view is that the Lamb of God refers to the Passover Lamb. And John is saying that Jesus is like the Passover Lamb. The Passover Lamb takes us all the way back to Egypt after God sent his plagues on Pharaoh so that he would let his people go. The final plague was the plague of the firstborn son. And God told his people that they were to take a one-year-old male lamb without defect and to slaughter it on the 14th day of the first month of Nisan and to roast it over the fire. And then they were to take some of the lamb's blood and to put it over their doorposts. And when that final plague came on Egypt, the angel of death would pass over the homes of those who had the blood on their doorpost. Forever after, God told his people to celebrate the Passover each year on the 14th of Nisan. And some people believe, well, I think a large majority of people believe that when John points to Jesus and says, look, the Lamb of God, he's saying, this is the Passover Lamb. This is the one who has come to bring deliverance from death. Um, just like that first Passover Lamb brought deliverance from death. There was also a morning and evening sacrifice at times in the nation of Israel of a lamb for the sins of the people. So it could be referring just to sacrifice in general. Um, there's also chapters like Isaiah 53 that talk about how Jesus, how the, the coming Messiah would go forth like a lamb and be slaughtered, but yet he would keep his mouth silent. John could be conjuring up that imagery. Uh, the other one that people have pointed to is Abraham and Isaac. When Abraham was called to sacrifice his son Isaac, the Lord stopped him from doing so. But then he provided a ram. So it's not exactly the, the same word, I don't think. I think we have two different animals there. But some have said maybe he's referring to that sacrifice, that substitute. But in any case, I think you can just say the Lamb of God means, look, this is the sacrifice that God sent into the world. Okay, uh, read Genesis 3, 1 to 6, and I, I'll have that on the screen too if you don't want to look it up. How did sin enter the world? So just a review. Um, Marilyn, would you read there for us, please? The serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. So the fall into sin, recorded in the third chapter of Genesis, the reason we're looking at this is because John said Jesus would be the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. How did sin enter the world? You probably all know uh, the account from Genesis chapter 3. So sin enters the world when Adam and Eve fall into sin, tempted by the serpent or the devil. devil. I think if you look at this, it's kind of interesting you know, this discussion question, how does Satan pretty much use the same tactics to lead people into sin today? Um, if you look at the verses on the screen, he's crafty more than any of the other wild animals. And you have to actually, you know, go to the New Testament to find out that this serpent, because otherwise you might just think it's a serpent, right? But then you're told that he's the ancient serpent, the devil he's identified as. Um, but he said to the woman, did God really say 
you must not eat free fruit from any tree in the garden. He puts doubt. Yeah. He tries to get you to doubt God's clear word or his command. Did God really say that you shouldn't be just a little dishonest with people if it benefits you? Um, did God really say that you have to work your hardest all the time? Um, or that you should, you know, that you should do your very best? Did God really say that it's harmful and hurtful to look at images on your computer that are involved with devious and dark things? You know, I mean, all of us. Is that really hurting them? You know, the devil tries to tempt us to question God's commands that, that we know are for the good. He's so much craftier than that that we know inside of us that those are wrong. Yeah. But when he gets God, gets us to doubt God's word, it's more like, are you really sure we can only have, one, there's only one way to heaven? Are you really sure being good isn't going to help? You know, God's yeah. going to look really good at you and... You know, are you really sure your dead grandmother isn't your angel? It, yeah. it's, he's very, he gets us where we are. And, and you may, you know, and I think what you're bringing up is maybe temptations that he uses to hit more lifelong or mature Christians. And some, because some of those other ones he could get some people to fall into, right? I mean, mm -hmm. and, and I've heard people often say you have different kind of temptations at different phases of your life, you know, um, maybe up until your 30s your temptations might be more on the side of uh, risk or over, especially for males probably, risk or overindulgence or sins of passion. And then it changes, you know, and, and they, I don't know the exact ages, but they'll say like from 30 to 55-ish, it might be more your career, you know, putting everything into your career or trying to get all this uh, material, all these material things or all this money to store up and then, usually, the last years, um, maybe the last half of your life is, is anxiety or worry about the future or family or things like that. And those are just generalizations. But I think there's some truth to them, that, these, that Satan knows which sins, which temptations to use on us at different part times of our life. And he's good at it, um, <laughs> sadly. Uh, Number three says, the fall into sin, oh wait, no, we're, we're not, we're doing this other version of this. Um, number three says, while Adam and Eve were the first to sin, of what truth does Romans 5.12 remind us? So we go to Romans 5.12, Leah, would you read there for us, please? Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. So, not only did Adam sin and Eve sin, the first humans, the first man, death entered the world after that sin. Uh, Romans also tells us the wages of sin is death, and that was true from the very beginning. Um, that once they violated God's command, the rightful punishment of breaking God's command is death. And in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. And, and you read that, you know, after Adam and Eve fall into sin, they have children, and you go right down the line, and you can read about their lives, and it says, and then he died, and then he died, and then he died. It's just like this continual repeating refrain of humanity's faith. But, according to Romans 5, 18 to 19, how did the one man, Jesus, reverse the verdict, Julie? Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. So just as this, like you might say that seems unfair, that one man's sin, one person's sin at the beginning could bring all of this death on the rest of humanity. Well, God says, in a corresponding way, but in the exact opposite, one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. That Christ's 
perfect life and death, his one act, his one uh, substitutionary sacrifice brings justification, brings a declaration of not guilty and life for all people. For justice through the disobedience of the one man, Adam, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, Christ, the many will be made righteous. So God reverses the downward trend of sin and death in Christ. Actually, does more than reverses, just kind of turns it all upside down. So that kind of sets the background for the main section of John that we want to look at tonight, which is Jesus' conversation with a man named Nicodemus. And I don't know if you have ever watched The Chosen. Um, it's kind of a modern adaptation of, of Christ's life. And you can watch it free, I believe, by downloading an app, or um, it's probably online too. It's, they're very well done. They kind of set more of the background of Jesus' life. Like it's not a word for word. Uh, from the Bible, but it is giving us a, kind of a, a glimpse into the characters uh, in Christ's life. And Nicodemus is very is a very interesting character because he was a Pharisee. He was one of the Jewish religious elite who thought that um, religion was about keeping laws. You know, simplistically putting, put religion was more about keeping laws than about trusting in God. And, and he turns. And here's a picture of Nicodemus and Jesus having this conversation at night, the one that we're going to read about here in John chapter 3. Pat, would you read 1 to 8 for us, please? Mm -hmm. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That is which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. So Nicodemus recognizes that Jesus is special, uh, that he's doing some um, amazing things from God. So he comes to him at night. Some have suggested that maybe because he doesn't want to be found out by his fellow Pharisees, and this is a way to kind of be a little bit more hidden. And he comes to him and says, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher from God. Otherwise, you couldn't perform these signs that you're doing. Um, Jesus says, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Jesus emphasizes the need to be born again. According to verse 6, why do we need to be born again? Because we were born of flesh, which is sin. Yeah. We have to be born of the Lord. Flesh gives birth to flesh. Now, going back to the Genesis account and how everyone born after Adam and Eve dies. Flesh gives birth to flesh. And we inherit sin and death that goes along with it from our parents. So Jesus says, flesh gives birth to flesh, and you must be born again. Because if you're not born again, you will die. Um, you will not have the life that God wants you to have. You will die eternally, ultimately, because you'll be in your sin. Um, according to verse 5, how is a person born again in the kingdom of God? Born of water and the Spirit um, seems to be pointing to baptism. You know, some have mentioned Jesus had not yet officially instituted baptism yet. 
So if he is talking specifically about baptism, he's talking about something that's going to come in the future. Um, but he's telling us, in any case, the power of the Spirit does it, right? Working through whether it's just the Word of God to make us born again, or whether it's working through the waters of baptism, connected with that Word. Um, this is how God brings people into his family, through his Spirit. And that's why I think um, it's interesting to say, unless they're born of water and the Spirit. And then he goes on to say, you know how the Spirit works? Look at verse 8. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. That the Spirit works in this mysterious way through the Word of God and creates faith where God and when God pleases to create faith. So in other words, it's not something you can do by your own acts of obedience, Nicodemus, but this is something that comes from me. Any questions on that? Otherwise, you can also, you know, if you want to jot questions down and you feel more comfortable watching, asking them at the end. Someone who watched online said, I really wanted to hear the questions last week because we, we turned it off and then asked questions. And I just said, I think it's just more comfortable for those who are attending to, you know, you can email me questions if you have them, if you're watching online. Uh, but I think that's just the way we'll do it because pe most people feel more comfortable just not being um, on YouTube when they're asking their questions. <laughs> so let's continue with John 3, 9 to 18. So now Nicodemus has some questions for Jesus. Uh, Marilyn, would you read for us there, please? How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And do you not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know, we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. So again, we have an Old Testament reference here um, to Moses lifting up the snake in the desert. So Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and he said Nicodemus you don't know these things and you are Israel's teacher um, you know there's something that's always puzzled me and that's verse 12 where he says I've spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe um, to me it seems like Jesus had just been speaking of heavenly things or of spiritual things um, I don't know if what he's saying is that he's been using earthly analogies you know like when he says the spirit blows here and there and we don't know where it comes from or where it goes uh, maybe that's what he means when he says he was speaking about earthly things. But he was just talking about how a person is born again of the Spirit. Um, probably the best way to understand that is that I just used some pretty easy earthly analogies for you, Nicodemus. I'm talking about birth, talking about the wind, and, and still you don't understand. So now I'm going to tell you further, um, and he refers to Numbers chapter 21. This is an incident in Israel's history uh, where the people grew um, impatient and they grumbled against God even though he had been providing for them and leading them. And we'll read uh, what happened here. Uh, Leah, would you read this, these verses for us from Numbers chapter 21? They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Eden. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. 
Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them, and they bit the people, and many Israelites died. And Julie, would you continue there? The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then, when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. So there's a lot of interesting things about this story. First of all, God, especially with his Old Testament people, when they sinned against him, when they grumbled against him, he would often teach them and lead them to repentance by punishing them. And here he punishes them by sending these venomous snakes among them. They cry out to him, and the Lord tells Moses to put this bronze snake up on a pole, and whoever looks to the snake will live. Um, in what way would Jesus be like the snake lifted up in the desert? It is interesting that like, they chose a snake, too, because the snake was the very thing that was killing them, and that's what they put up on the pole. I don't know that there's significance in that, that we need... I've never focused or yeah, had that in a Bible this. class, that that was the snake. But if they, hadn't, if they had no faith in God's word to look at the snake, they wouldn't have looked up and they wouldn't have been healed. It yeah. brought them to look up to what God was saying. And it's fascinating that Jesus chooses to use this picture of how people were saved just by looking to the snake. And if you didn't believe that that snake would heal you, you probably wouldn't bother. You wouldn't believe the words of Moses that said, look to the snake and you will live. Um, I don't know if people, you know, I'm guessing... In all of my Bible history books, it's like everybody's just around the snake dying. But you would think that maybe this happened spread throughout a large area in the camp and people had to bring them to the snake. So in that sense, they would have had to have the faith to say, can you please bring me to the snake that I've heard about that Moses put up? So there's faith. It's trusting that what God says is true and that that bronze snake is actually going to uh, heal them. Looking to the bronze snake, God is going to heal them through the bronze snake, I should say. There's nothing magical or mystical about the bronze snake itself, but it's God working through that symbol to bless them and to heal them. And it's so easy. It's such an easy thing yeah. to do. All they had to do was look. Yeah. He didn't say, you know, go search for this plant and mash it into a poultice and boil it on the stove and then add something else and then rub it on your wound um, and then you know pray this 25 times and or pay or pay something he just said look to this and you will live and i think jesus point with nicodemus is this is what faith is like faith believes god's word and looks to christ and some have, I mean, like with, I don't know how far you want to press this or if we even should, but some um, commentators, church fathers, have talked about how on the cross, Jesus became our sin to take away sin. In the sense that that snake there is the cause of their death and it takes away their death. You know, I, I don't know if that was there in the Old Testament or not. I think it'd be hard to prove. It could be. Um, it's definitely not a bad thing to think about. Number seven says, in Romans, the Apostle Paul says that the wages of sin is death. A just and holy God can rightfully condemn anyone who has sinned. Sin is, in essence, an attempt to remove God or to at least rebel against his holiness. According to verses 8 and 19 here, um, 18 and 19, how are we saved from eternal separation from God? Leah, would you read 18 and 19 again for us there, please? Sure. 
Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. So do you see the, the correlation here between looking to the bronze snake and believing in God's Son? Um, how are we saved? How are we not condemned? Whoever believes in him is not condemned. And believing means trusting in him. Trusting in his word that it's true and that it's true for you. Number eight says, someone gives you a check for a million dollars on your birthday, but since you don't believe them, or since you don't believe that they have a million dollars in their account, you don't cash the check. Jesus' death has paid for the sins of the world. In other words, there is enough righteousness there for everyone. And his perfect sacrifice covered every sin ever committed. How is faith like cashing the check? And in this analogy, it's not perfect. And if you want to press it to its uh, theological limits, it, it's not exactly what God says. But how is Believing that Jesus' death pays for your sin, kind of like cashing that check that someone says has enough money in the bank to cover the, the number written on it. You can reject him. You could not cash a check, right? Um, and that doesn't mean that Jesus didn't die for you. It means that you just refused the payment that's already there. Or think your sin is too great. Which is even worse, to think, I don't deserve for God to forgive me. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of how what Judas, you know, you think of Judas and Peter, and both of them betrayed or rejected Christ. And the only difference is Judas thought that his sin was too great for Jesus to forgive him, and Peter um, was called back to Jesus when he... Um, basically called him to, when Jesus called Peter to repentance and Peter repented. Martin Luther found great personal comfort in John 3.16 and especially in the words that God so loved the world. He said, I'm glad that this passage doesn't say God so loved Martin Luther. He reasoned that such a statement would allow for some uncertainty. And Luther was so conscious of his own sin that I could see, I, I don't remember the exact context of this, these words by Luther, but you can imagine Luther saying, well, he must be talking about some other Martin Luther because I know myself and I don't deserve God's love. So Luther is like, it's actually better that he just said he loves the world. Um, what does it mean for you to know that Jesus died for the sins of the world? Because you're part of the world. Yeah. You're just you, you can't be excluded. You can't be excluded from that. It's it's a completely um, all encompassing term. The world. If you're living in this world, Jesus died for your sins and his payment was enough. Like we said, in the analogy that's not perfect, you can reject that. You can refuse to believe that. But we often talk about the objective truth of Jesus' death. That whether someone believes it or not, Jesus died for them. And, and he paid the price for their sins. Um, and what a comfort for us that if you think that, you know, you are too much of a sinner or you're too, um, too doubting or too um, miserable or just not, not worth God's love, you have that, that pure promise of God so loved the world. And Jesus died for you. And everyone you care about. That's, I mean, as a grandma, that's a really big deal. Mm -hmm. It's not, it doesn't matter what they're going through. 
Jesus died for them mm -hmm. too. Number 10, last one. Some people think that Jesus came just to show us how to live a good life here on earth. According to these verses, what did Jesus really come to do? And why is this so much better? God gave his law through Moses which we summarize in the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. And then 9 and 10 are you shall not covet your neighbor's property or his wife or his house. Um, those are the Ten Commandments that God gave through Moses. If Jesus just came to show us how to live and to give us more commandments, that really wouldn't have helped us out that much because we couldn't even keep the commandments that God gave through Moses. So if he just intensified it and made it even more difficult, that would not be what we need. Um, but instead, he comes to perfectly keep God's law in our place to show us what it means to truly love, honor, and obey God above everything else and to love his neighbor as himself and then to give himself as a sacrifice for all those who haven't done what he did, who haven't been able to keep God's commandments perfectly, who have sinned. And God says, because he's the perfect son of God, that's enough. And that's the, the gospel. This is so much better than just another example showing us how to live. This is a savior. And that's what Jesus is trying to get across to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So for next time, um, if you haven't already, memorize John 3.16, if you'd like, and read John chapter 11 and 20 uh, to prepare for next time. And if you're watching online, we're going to break off. Thank you for joining us tonight. And if you were built up by this study, make sure to share it with someone else. We're happy to have more people Join us in our study of God's word, and we'll see you next week. But let's close with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your one and only Son. Thank you for loving us so much to send what we needed, a Savior in Jesus, the one who was lifted up just like Moses lifted up that bronze snake in the desert to be our source of salvation and eternal life. We ask that you bless us in Jesus' name. Amen.